So, um, so welcome to my talk about Just Interrupt. Uh, I'm still Julien Jamais. I'm still engineer at Google, I hope. <laughs> I have still access to my email, so I guess I'm not far. To... Uh, let's start this presentation by uh, asking a question. Why do we need Just Interrupt? In fact, uh, ten, ten years ago, GS ecosystem, the JavaScript ecosystem was poor, and then it sucks a bit. So um, JavaScript was used to do you no know, form validation, and nobody told at that time that it was possible to build a big application in JavaScript like Gmail or like uh, Google Docs or like Google Spreadsheet. Also, um, there was no uh, standard defined across the different browsers, so you had to write uh, different JavaScript for doing the same thing on different browsers. So the, the, the rule of thumb was don't try to write your own JavaScript directly. Use Grid as an abstraction layer on, um, on JavaScript. But if you really want to, to write your own JavaScript, you can use Disney or GCO. Um, no, it's a bit different. The JavaScript ecosystem works. The community in, is uh, more larger and richer. There are a lot of cool libraries you know, in uh, the JavaScript ecosystem, like AngularJS, for example. And th this cool library adds, brings some added value. And as a good developer, uh, we want to take advantage of this library. Um, so there are a lot of cool stuff out there that you can reuse in your grid application and save some time and some work. Uh, some people, at the beginning, some people tried to rewrite the JS uh, library entirely. It's what we did with Manolo about uh, jQuery when we rewrite entirely jQuery in grid. Um, this is a huge work <laughs> just to rewrite a, a JavaScript library. And it's also a huge work to maintain this kind of library. So another option was to wrap the, the JavaScript library using some Disney or overlay type. But you know this is a kind of, of pain. And when you look at the code of this kind of wrapper, there are a lot of boilerplate code that actually we could, could be auto-generated. Uh, so we need a better system to interpret with JavaScript. And in Grid 2.7, we introduced the beginning of a new, more efficient, more idiomatic uh, JavaScript interrupt uh, system in order to replace uh, the Disney wrapping and the overlay type. And in Grid 2.8, we have implemented uh, the final specification of the JS interrupt. And it's what we will look into this presentation. JS interrupt is a two-way street. It's a bidirectional interrupt system. That means that with JS interrupt, you can export any Java type to JavaScript, but also you can expose any JavaScript library in your Java code. Oh. <coughs> Sorry. We'll go, uh, let's go into the, the JS interrupt specification. So we will look at first the, the, the specification, and at the end I will show you an example how to use JS interrupt to build uh, an Angular application by using only grid and no uh, uh, JavaScript uh, line of code. So the first thing to know is how to enable JS interrupt. Uh, now in grid 2.8, um, JS, interrupt, JS interrupt is not experimental anymore, so it's enabled by default. You don't have to do anything except if you want to export your Java type to JavaScript. This is disabled by default, and if you want to enable that, you have to set the flag uh, generate JS interrupt export to true. So if you want anything from your code to be called from JavaScript, you need to set this flag to true. And I will explain later why we put by default uh, this flag to, to false. Um, and the first, um, the first annotation to explain in uh, GSN, the first feature in JS interrupt is the GS type uh, application. 
Uh, the GS type application can be used on uh, Java type, and that allow you to expose the public API of your Java type to the JavaScript world. So, if you look at this example, uh, my class bar is annotated with GS type, so that means that on the JavaScript side, we could write a JavaScript code that will directly instantiate my, uh, my object by using new kung fu bar. In fact, we expose the constructor and all the static method on the namespace that is um, uh, named by the, 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 the package. And you can use any public API of your object, so that means that you can access to any public field, and you can also access to any um, public method and static method and public static field, and so on. The first thing to know with GSType is the GSType annotation is not uh, inherited, so that means that the subtype are not automatically exposed to JavaScript. Only the public API defined in the parent class is exposed. And let's take this, let, <coughs> let's take this example. So we have a, a parent class here with, that defines a parent method. And we annotate the, the parent class with GS type. And then we extend this class with the child class, where we define a new method. Uh, the first thing is, if we try to instantiate the child, of the child type on the JavaScript, JavaScript side, uh, this will not work because the child constructor is not exposed because this is not a GS type. So let's add a static method on the parent that allows us to, um, to instantiate the object on the JavaScript side. So now we, have, we get uh, an instance of the, the child, uh, the child uh, type. And in this case, the public API of the parent class is accessible, so you can call child.parent method, and this will work. But if you try to call the child method, define a child class, that will fail. Let's talk about JS property, JS method, and JS constructor. So let's come back with the same example. We have the bar, the bar type that we put the JS type in uh, above the, the, the type. <coughs> doing that is equivalent to us doing this thing. That means that when you when you put JS type above your Java type. That means that it's the same thing that if you put GS property on all public property, GS constructor, constructor or the, on the constructor, and GS method on every uh, method. Uh, the thing is, we can use GS property, GS method to fine tune the API you want to expose in the Java. So, for example, in this case, if I use, if I had a public method foot end, foo end but I don't an annotate this method with JS method, you cannot call this method on JavaScript side because this method will not be exported by JS interrupt. So it's really a way to fine tune your code generation and to decide um, which method has to be exposed or not. And JS property, um, can be used also on method. So let's take, I will talk about the native JS type in the few slides, but let's take, we have, we have an interface bar, an interface bar, sorry. And we have a method set foo and get foo, and we annotate this method by JS property. That means that, uh, on Java, okay, you get uh, an instance of this bar method. And this code here, so you call the getFoo method and the setFoo method, will be, um, will be transpired to a GS property. So instead of calling bar the, the getFoo, the compiler will replace the call of the method to, um, to the, the access to the GS property defined. Because on interface, there is no way to define fields. 
And so if you want to access Phil, this interface is defining something that exists in the JavaScript side. And if this, this type has some field, as we define an interface, we cannot specify a field here. So the way to do that is define a method with GS properties. Um, another annotation to know is the GS in, in know. So we come back with the same example here. If you put GS type on bar, we expose all the public API, except um, the method or the field or the constructor uh, that are annotated with GS in your. Uh, it's another way to fine tune what method has to be explored or not. And, um, and here, you have to keep in mind something with GS interrupt. Um, when you expose your type with GS type, all the method, all the, the method, the constructor will be act like an entry point of your application. So that means that the grid compiler will not be able to know if your method is used or not. Because as you expose that to JavaScript world, the grid compiler doesn't know the external JavaScript world. So it's not able to, for, to know if uh, the method is used somewhere or not. So it will not delete or not prune the method if the method is not used in your Java code. So it's, and it's why, in fact, we set the flag to JS export uh, the, 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 first flag, the first flag to disable the export by default. So that, that avoid that you, um, um, that you have too many entry points in your application and that avoid that the compiler is not able to prune the code that is not used in your, in your, uh, in your application. So it's important to use JS in your, on each method or constructor that it's not intended to use in the JavaScript side. So for example, if my, let's take this, uh, this class, is I know that the bar object doesn't have to, will never be instantiated on the JavaScript side, we have to put the JS in your ignore here. Because if you do that, the grid compiler is able to know if the class, if the object will be instantiated or not. And if the object is not instantiated, it can prune all the code for this class because it's pretty sure that it is sure that the, the, the method will never be called even in the JavaScript side because um, the, the object cannot be instantiated on the JavaScript and in, on your Java side, you never instantiate the object, so the class will be never used. Some uh, restriction of non-native GS type. Uh, a GS type cannot have method or property with the same JavaScript name, that we have to avoid name collision. And here we are born to the JavaScript semantics. So in JavaScript, you cannot define a field and a method on the same object with the same name. It's not authorized. So you have to, to change the, the, the JavaScript name to avoid collision. For that, we can use the name attribute. I will come back on the name attribute in a few slides to avoid a uh, name collision in JavaScript. Uh, you cannot have only one GS uh, only one constructor annotated with GS constructor in the type. And if you have other constructor, uh, they need to delegate to this constructor. Um, if it's not the case, if we have constructor that doesn't follow the rule above, you have to use GS in your to in your test constructor. Anyway, the, if you don't do that, the grid compiler will not be happy and you will get an error. And also, with the non-native GS type, grid doesn't support method overloading, just because JavaScript doesn't support method of overloading. Let's talk a bit about native GS type. Um, to declare a native GS type, you have to use the GS type annotation and put the attribute is native to true. Uh, that means that here we are defining an existing JavaScript library. Uh, it's important to understand that for this kind of type, the grid compiler will not generate any code because this is just a way to expose the API of the JavaScript code, of the, the JavaScript code in Java and make the Java compiler happy. That's it. 
So this is the example where you uh, we define uh, a part of the API of uh, jQuery that we can use, that we want to use in our application. So we define here public native method. So you say to the compiler, okay, I'm not implementing this this method. The method is implementing in JavaScript. And here, what I have here is I define uh, a native static method in order to access the global jQuery object. So often the JavaScript library uh, define uh, a global object in the global scope that we have to access. This is the way to access here the dollar method in the, in the Windows object. And then you can use um, the, your JavaScript library in Java as like in JavaScript. Uh, you can extend or implement native JS type. Uh, that will be very useful when web, web component uh, starts supporting uh, ES6 classes. So let's here we define a native uh, native JS type is the, the the type HTML element that exists on the browser API, and here we extend this type to create a custom element. Um, let's talk about JS overlay method. Um, no. The JS overlay method is a way to add some logic on uh, native JS type. So we will see that uh, normally uh, native JS type can contain only uh, public native method, only native method at least. And so sometime Sometimes it's uh, easier for the developer to add some, some logic in the component without the need to extend the object or thing like that. So we can use uh, a public final, final method that doesn't over, override any um, method existing on the parent. If the, the class uh, extends uh, a parent class, you cannot override any, any method here. So and you annotate this uh, method with JS overlay, and you can implement anything you want here. Well, let's talk about the native JS type restriction. Um, yeah, a native JS type can only extend and implement native JS type, but you can extend a native JS type with a non-native JS type. I hope it's clear. Um, a native JS type class can only wave if public uh, native methods. You can also define public and uninitialized field. You can define constructor, but the, the constructor has to be empty because the the construct the, the body the implementation of the constructor is done on the JavaScript side. Uh, you can uh, define final non-native method that doesn't override any other method and you have to use the GS overlay annotation on it. Uh, another power powerful feature of GS interrupt is the ability to represent a JavaScript function. Um, so let's take the, this example. I, Let's take the, the, public in the, 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 the um, native type promises. In promises, we have two errors, two, two methods, success or error. And this method in JavaScript are uh, taking a uh, function as parameter. It's called back function. And if you want to do that in Java, you have to define a public interface annotated with JS function that contain only one method. And to be sure that the contract will not be broken by someone else, we recommend to also to use the functional interface annotation. It's a new annotation from Java 8. Uh, if you put several methods on the on the interface with annotated with functional interface, the Java compiler uh, will complain about that. So so that we're sure that nobody will break your code. But that works in the other way around. So let's take the example where we define a static, uh, a static method that is accessible in, in, in JavaScript. So we can, in JavaScript, we can access the, the action method here. 
and this, we want we want to give the ability the, the possibility to the JavaScript developer to call our method by passing a function. But we have to do, to do the same thing here. We use the full type, and the full type is a JS function interface, and everything will work fine. Um, let's talk uh, about name and namespace. Um, all the JS interpreter notation except JS uh, constructor, JS senior, and JS package have a name and namespace attribute. So the goal of this attribute, in fact, are to modify the code generation. So let's take the, the first example. And now we set the name and the namespace attribute to foo and drame. If you want to call this object in the JavaScript site, you, know, you have changed now the default, the default namespace is normally the package. Now the package is jdrame. And the name of, the, of the, the type is accessible in the uh, via the, the full object. Uh, another concrete example that uh, with name and namespace. Uh, let's take an example that you want to uh, create a type that, in fact, is a native JavaScript array behind the scene. The way to do that is simply to say, okay, is this is a native. A JS type, so that means the implementation is done on JavaScript. And the namespace is global, so that means that this object, this class representation in JavaScript exists on the global scope, so that means on the Windows object. And the name of this object is array. Each time you will flip, we will do new JS array, we will, the, the JavaScript code will um, instantiate a native JavaScript array. And so you can define here uh, the method existing on the array API. It's also useful to use name and namespace to access one method of existing JavaScript objects. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that I use uh, re regularly when I want to debug my code right now in JS interrupt. It's if you want to load something on the console, you don't have to create a console object with the lock message, you just with the lock method. We just have to create a native static uh, method log and say, okay, this log is defined on the console <coughs> object. And automatically, when you call this method in Java, the Win compiler will replace the call of this method by console.log. And that works. And another way also is to access uh, object defined in the global code. Let's take the example of Angular. Angular defined. Uh, an Angular object on the Windows. And if you want to access this object in your Java code, the best is to create a native static method. And you just say, okay, this method is not defined on foo, but it's defined on the global, global scope. And here, it, this is a JS property, so we, we follow the, the, the Java Bean convention. And so um, the code of this method will be replaced in simply by Angular, and so you will target the right object. Um, yeah, and the last uh, annotation to know is the JS package. Uh, if we want to define uh, uh, another names, uh, namespace for all the classes in one package, you can create a package in for Java and use the JS package annotation that will define the namespace for every class is in your package, except if you overwrite on a class the namespace. <coughs> okay, note that we know all GS interrupt works. Let's uh, take a look at the example I built to, um, to explain a bit more GS interrupt. So I've created uh, I started from an existing Angular application that I found, in fact, in the Angular uh, website. Um, so this is, the, this is a to-do application. This is a bit usual as an example. And this is the code used by Angular. So we have the HTML code here. Uh, we have all the Angular directive um, and things like that. We will so 
uh, that's more later. And this is the code used by Angular to build the application. So in Angular, you define a module, you define uh, one server controller. In this case, we define only one controller. And this is, this is the, the, the code of uh, the controller. And let's take a look how to do that uh, in Gwent directly. Uh, the first thing to do is we remove the to-do.js because we will implement everything in, in Gwent. So we will replace that with our uh, JavaScript generated by Gwent. Then the, 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 the second thing to do is to write the Angular API we need in our application. So in this case, we, have, we need two methods. On the, uh, first, we need to access the Angular object. And on the Angular object, we need two methods, the module method that we create a module. And here, we use the for each method uh, to iterate on the GS array. So this is the code that we need to, to do that. So we define uh, a class Angular. We say, OK, it's a JS style, and it's a native JS style, because Grid doesn't have to generate anything here, or the implementation is done in, uh, in JavaScript. We need to access the Angular object. So for that, we use a public static native method, get Angular, And we say, OK, the Angular object exists on the global namespace. And we define the two methods, the two native methods that we need. So we have the module. Uh, method that will return a module object that will take the name of the module and the uh, other uh, module require. Um, and then we define the for each method that take a JS array. So the JS array is the same as the code that I show a few, uh, few, uh, the, uh, previously. And here, in the for each method, normally the JavaScript developer is passing a, 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 a JavaScript function. So we have to define a JS function interface. Now that we have that, uh, we have to define the API of the module object. So the module object is one method. Uh, the possibility to uh, define a controller. Uh, we have to pass in the controller the name of the controller. It's the identifier of your controller, in fact. And you have to pass the um, constructor function, function of your uh, controller type. Now for that, I, I've created another JS function, name it controller function. Because in, if you come back in JavaScript, Sorry. people will pass a function as argument. So I have to create a JS function here. Now let's implement the, the controller logic. <coughs> so for that, I just create a to do list controller. Um, you see here, it's not a native, and it's not a native uh, GS type because the implementation now is done on Java. It's my implementation. So if you come back on, on the on the GS, you see that okay, the controller has two fields. We have the uh, to do. This is an array of to do, and we have another field is it to do text. So we define these two fields, and we have three uh, three methods. So we define as well. This method. So you have the two field here. You have the, the constructor that uh, initializes the, the, the JS array. Uh, you have the add to do, the remaining, and the archive uh, method. And if you look at the, uh, at the implementation of the method, it's very, very similar. It's really the same. Um, just take a look here. I'm using the, the Java 8 Lambda here. Um, it's it's really cool you now with the Lambda because the Java code is less verbose than in, in JavaScript. If you look here, you don't have to, to define function. In one line of code, you uh, do everything. Yeah, and we have to use a JS type here because I'll, 
us, we will use the name of the method and the field in our HTML to tell to Angular what method it has to call on user action. We have to use a GS type on the controller to avoid that the good compiler rename the method. And one thing also, um, I put here GS ignore in my to-do list controller because uh, this object will on, only be uh, instantiated on my application, on the Java application, and never on the JavaScript side. This is the model. So if we come back a second in the, in the HTML, uh, in the model, we have the to-do, and the to-do object is two fields, done and text. So I created a, a, a GS type to do with two, two fields. And I've created a, a constructor. And I put GS ignore here because I don't expect as well that an external JavaScript library uh, instantiates uh, my object. Oops. And now um, we have. We have everything we need. We have the Angular API. We have the controller or the logic implemented. And now we have to put everything together. So I have to create my entry point, entry point class. Uh, and here, what I do is, OK, I call the Angular. Sorry, I get the Angular, um, the Angular object. And then I create, I, I call the module the module method by giving the identifier onto my module. And on this module, I define one controller, the to-do list controller. And here, it's a new feature in Java. I give the constructor. We can use method references in Java. And I give the, the constructor function on my to-do list controller. If you do that and you try the application, uh, it will not work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and this is the end of my talk. <laughs> now, uh, we, have, um, we have, in fact, a, 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 an issue with Angular here. Is that it's what I call the Angular bootstrapping issue. Um, in fact, on, you have to know how Angular works to resolve this issue. Is that when the DOM is ready, Angular starts by traverse the DOM and find an object with the directive ng app. And if Angular finds this directive, uh, it will bootstrap the Angular application. The problem here is that Angular will do that before that your grid code is, is uh, executed. So that means that your a uh, module to do app will not be defined yet when Angular will, will boost up your application. But if you use the single, the single script, it should work because it, it's loaded. Yeah, but I don't want to use that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the way to, to, to do that is simply to uh, disable this uh, automatic bootstrap. So the first thing to do is to remove this ng app directive. So um, Angular will, uh, will look into the DOM and will not find any uh, Angular application. So it will do nothing. And in Angular, you have a method named bootstrap. It's a clever name. But that means that we can bootstrap yourself, uh, your application. And for that, you just have to give the root element of uh, your Angular application and the module that uh, the application has to use. So, it was, uh, I, so it's why I uh, had this method on the Angular API, because I will use it right now. And when I have defined my module and my controller, I just call the bootstrap method to say, OK, no, everything is well defined. Angular, do your job. Uh, I need the root element of, the, of my application. And in this case, it's the document. So I just had a get document method to access the document uh, global object and you can pass the, this object to Angular. Uh, so if you use this application, no, it works. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, but we'll go a bit further and we'll try to use the Angular dependency in injection. But I will do something before.
So Angular has its own dependency injection. Um, this is an example with AngularJS of, of how to use the dependency injection in JavaScript. So when you call the controller method now, you, did, you still pass a controller identifier. And then we pass an array of objects. And in this array, the first element of the array is the identifier of the component that we want to inject inside your controller. So here, for example, in this example, I have three dependencies that I want to inject inside my controller. For example, the, the scope is a dependency, it's a built-in de dependency from Angular. So you ask Angular, okay, give, give me the, the, the scope dependency. And so let's do that in our PD.js. And let's, let's inject in our controller the HTTP service. HTTP service is a built-in service of Angular to uh, do a HTTP request. So, and if you want to access to, if you want to uh, inject this dependency, you have the, the dependency is available under the identifier $HTTP. So what you do is you modify your controller method to pass an array, where the first uh, element of your array is the, the identifier of the HTTP service, and you modify your constructor function to accept uh, the HTTP service uh, as an um, argument. And then you can use it, but we will, do, we will see that later. So I want to do that in Java as well. So I have uh, modified my controller method to accept uh, uh, an object uh, uh, parameter. And I have also uh, changed the controller function, the, the GS function uh, interface to accept the HTTP service as uh, an argument. Now I just have to define the HTTP service API because it's an API uh, provided by Angular and I want to use it. So I will use the get method on the HTTP service that take as uh, argument the, 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 the URL. Or this, this service return another object that I call HTTP formalizes. Uh, it's still native uh, object. And on this uh, HTTP promise object, I will just call the success method that will take a callback. And so I define my inter callback interface by using a GS function. And this callback function will receive, in fact, uh, the data uh, behind the, the URL. So what I have to do here is just to you know, change my to-do list controller to accept the HTTP service um, to get the and to call the HTTP service to retrieve the data on the server. So it will get a JSON. And when it's successful, what I do is that I initialize, I initialize, initialize my to-do Array with the data I receive from the server. And now, the only thing I have to do is to put in place the dependency injection. So I change the call of the controller function where I pass uh, uh, an object array and say, okay, <coughs> Angular, please provide me the HTTP server, uh, the HTTP service instance in my controller, and you continue to pass the the constructor of your uh, controller. And it works. It was very fine. So <laughs> I didn't, I mean, I didn't think that when I tried, but <laughs> it was. So. But here uh, we have a uh, hidden issue, in fact, here. So like I said, if you, if you compile the application and we try it, that really works pretty fine. But we have an issue here. Um, the issue is there, in fact. And maybe this slide you will, you will see where is the issue. The thing is that we will receive a JSON. Um, that means that Angular will create this object uh, itself by uh, calling the JSON parsed. And then we assign this object to the type to do. Or this is a problem because normally my object is not, I don't expect that 
something external to my Java code instantiate this object. So this will work because the object here has two fields, so they share the same API. But now imagine that in my class here, I have some method. If I have some method here, and I try to invoke the method on the object created by Angular, that will not work because the method doesn't exist on this object. And they are even worse. If you did redefine the equals and the hash code method on your to-do, and you put all the to-do in an hash map, all the to-do coming from the server will, will be lost forever. Because the hash code and the, the request method are not overhidden for, for the object created by Angular. So, the best practice in this case is to define an extra interface to say, okay, Angular will create object itself, so I have to create a native interface to do DTO, where we define that on this DTO I will get two JS property, text and DOM. Then you modified your, your, mod, your model to uh, allow you to create a to-do uh, with uh, a to-do DTO. And then you modify a bit your uh, success method, say, okay, when I receive all the DTO, I create myself the to-do. This is not a Java uh, issue. This is a JavaScript issue. The, the thing is that I think that for JavaScript programmer, JavaScript programmer are aware about that. But for Java, it's a bit confusing because Java allow you to, at least Grid allow you to cast the object in to-do. But this is not a to-do instance. If you do an instance of, if you, you if from the object that has been created uh, with JSON, you do an instance of to-do, you will receive false. So it just, it's, it's really, it's, it's, an, it's what I call that an hidden issue because it's not really, um, not really visible for Java programmer, in fact. So this is, uh, this is a, a good practice to, if you want to do things like that, uh, every object that is constructed on the JavaScript side should be a native uh, JS type. Wait, like demo. It would be really quick. Okay, so so this this is my project. So we have all the all the the Java object that I presented in my uh, in my presentation. So we have the uh, let's say the Angular API here. We have the module using the inline array annotation. Uh, we have the controller construction, etc. We have the, this is the Angular app. So this is exactly what I show you into the slide where we use the constructor references here. And I'm using the to do DTO. I have, this is my model that is able to consume a to do DTO. And this is my uh, to do list uh, controller. So now if I start the application. <coughs> and this is the application working in fact. So you can archive the, the, the to-do, you can create a new to-do. Oops, we did wrong. Uh, you can flag as done or not, etc. And if you reload, we reload the. So it was a short demo, but <laughs> just to to show you that the code works. <laughs> yeah. 
And I don't know where is my presentation. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm here. Oh.